Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Penn Live Opinion Editor John Mysick. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we have a discussion uh, this morning for the next hour with State Representative Mark Rossi, a Democrat of Berks County, uh, with the pending release of a grand jury report on uh, alleged sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Um, should warn viewers that what they may hear, what they are about to hear, may disturb them. Um, Representative Rossi, who hails from outside of Reading, has been on the front lines of the battle to amend the state's statute of limitations law. Uh, in child sexual abuse cases, please feel free to ring in in the comments. Uh, for those of you watching on the Facebook Live, we'll try to get to questions as we can. Representative Rossi, thanks for joining us Thank this you morning. For Thank you. Um, we normally do this one of two ways. We can allow our guests. We normally allow our guests to offer an opening statement or a preamble if they want to, or we can dive straight into questions. It's your hour, so however you'd like to proceed. Uh, I'm here just to be the voice for victims today, so go ahead. Let's start right into it. Um, Mark, why don't you start by laying out kind of the, the, the landscape of um, where we are in the state in terms of the law, the statute of limitations, and where, you know, the, the recourse and the obstacles that victims have had as a result of that. Okay. The, the current statute of limitations in Pennsylvania is you have till age 30, civilly, and age 50, criminally, to come forward. That puts Pennsylvania about in the, in the middle of protecting kids in the United States as far as laws go. Um, we definitely want to be the best in Pennsylvania. We think kids should be protected. Uh, that shouldn't be a, a partisan effort here. It should be bipartisan. And to do that, we need to eliminate the criminal and civil statutes completely, abolish them. Because one thing we know, the average age of a victim coming forward is age 52. Our statutes don't even cover that age. So victims are coming forward after their statutes uh, are expired. And the one thing that we know is that pedophiles do not stop abusing, that they will continue to find more and more victims. Um, the problem with those statutes are that they were just recently changed to that in 2006. Now, most of the victims that are going to be in this grand jury report, their statute limitations were probably two years civilly and five years criminally to come forward. That's what my statutes were in 1984 when Father Graf raped me in the shower. Think about that. 13 years old and I only two years civilly and five years criminally to come forward. I had to come forward by age 18 to the police to tell them that what this priest did, sexually abused me, raped me. And that was just never going to happen. I mean, I didn't come forward until age 39, until my second childhood friend killed himself. That's when I had the ability to step forward and said, enough is enough. I can't take this anymore. I saw my first childhood friend kill himself. I knew my other friends were alcoholic, drug addicts, suffering. And we were all suffering in silence. That's why it's important, the statute of limitations, that they must be abolished. We must give victims the ability to come forward on their own time schedule. Why is it in Pennsylvania that perpetrators have more power over sexual abuse victims? Kids, kids that were sexually abused. The system is unfair right now. That's why it's important to eliminate. Plus, we want to add the retroactive two-year window into this bill, which would give anybody who's been timed out of the past the ability to come forward and file a civil lawsuit. Um, the bill currently in the House that we have uh, is going to be gutted and replaced, and, and that's what we're looking to put into the bill. Everything that the victims want. Elimination, both civil and criminal, and the two-year window. That's important. That is what will bring justice to these victims. And there are two bills right now pending, correct? Well, we have the bill that is the vehicle is going to be Senate Bill 261, uh, Senator Joe Scarnati's bill. Uh, he already passed that out of the Senate, it already passed out of the House Judiciary Committee, and it's currently into, uh, just tabled in the House. So it is ready to go. Um, we're just waiting to decide when we want to run this bill. Traditionally, the Senate has been sort of resistant to that far of a look back on the statute of limitations, arguing that in criminal cases that people die, memories fade, evidence trails go, go cold, all that kind of thing. Um, that in civil cases, the retroactivity clause can open the window to, say, bankrupting an institution like the, like the church. Um, are, how sympathetic are you, one, to those concerns, and two, what conversations are you aware of with the Senate, if any, that might make them more amenable to these changes this time around than the last round, which I think was in 2018? Mm -hmm. 
those comments to me have no base. Okay. And when, when you ask the victim, like, oh, like your memories fade, um, I can tell you the amount of victims I've spoken to, and every one of them can tell you their story like it was yesterday. Um, so that's, that's not a concern to me. Um, they definitely are using, the senators that are holding this bill up are definitely using talking points directly from the Catholic Conference and the Insurance Federation. They are saying that the retroactive component would be unconstitutional. Again, we don't have one constitutional law expert in the House or Senate or on staff. So don't tell me it's unconstitutional. You don't have an idea. You're not a Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice. That is up to the black robes to make this decision. Not Senator Joe Scarnati, not Senator Jake Corman. It's, they're, it's almost like they have the audacity to stand in the way here of victims from getting justice. That's what's going on here. Um, they're using talking points directly handed to them from lobbyists that are spending millions of dollars to block this bill. When the bill passed the House 180 to 15 last session, okay, it passed 180 to 15. We had enough support in the House, overwhelming, and it went to the Senate. Senator Greenleaf decided that we had to have a judiciary constitutionality hearing. We pass unconstitutional bills all the time, and we never have hearings. Never. Why all of a sudden are we having a hearing on the constitutionality of the retroactive component? And then we have this hearing, and Senator Greenleaf brings in four Roman Catholic conference, four Roman Catholic professors to testify that the bill was unconstitutional. They allowed us one testifier, Marcy Hamilton, who actually is a constitutional law expert. They won't allow anybody else to testify on our behalf. And he put her last, so by the time she testified, everybody in that committee was gone. That, to me, was an absolute slap in the face, a dog and pony show, by the Senate Judiciary Chairman to influence his members that this bill would be unconstitutional. And again, not one of them is a constitutional law expert, so I don't want to hear it. You don't know. This, is, this has never been ruled on in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So why are they standing in the way? You have to ask yourself, why are they blocked in victims from getting justice? Who are they protecting? Just for the sake of, just for the sake of argument and all due respect, so say there is a, say there is a constitutional challenge to the statute. It goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court finds against you, mm -hmm. thus denying justice to victims in any of this. Ought it not be better to get the result right first? Withstanding a potential constitutional challenge rather than rolling the dice and hoping no, we need to roll the dice. We need the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to make this decision. They're the only ones that have this answer. And I can tell you this I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of victims across the state. And for us, it would be final determination that we tried everything we could under the law of Pennsylvania to try to get justice. Um, so to me, you know, uh, one of the Senate staffers made a comment uh, from Jake Corman's office, I think it was Jennifer Coker, who said that victims would be devastated if it would go to the Supreme Court and it would be ruled unconstitutional. My comment back to her is victims were devastated where they were raped and sexually abused as children. They're not going to be devastated by getting an answer by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. That would it's either going to give us justice or it's going to give us the means to the end. And that's all we want at this point. That, re that, re sorry. that retroactive component, that has been the main sticking point, correct? Yeah, that has been definitely one of the main sticking points. Also, the civil statute, a lot of them would like to see it only go to age 50, and we would like to eliminate it. We're not looking to protect institutions any further. Why is the criminal statute 50 now and the civil statute 30? We've been... Been protecting institutions. And again, they need to be put on the same playing field. If institutions are going to protect pedophiles, they need to be held responsible. And that's, you know, I keep hearing the bishops of this, of the six dioceses saying that they support this grand jury report, 
that's great. But we need more than support. We need you to take responsibility now for your actions. That's what we need. So the report's supposed to be out uh, sometime in June. We heard early June, we heard late June. I'd like to ask you directly, have you seen the report? Do you have any inkling of what's in the report? I know you've made some comments that there are a lot of victims mm -hmm. included in this. Can you just talk about the report as you know right, right now? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen the report. I don't know what's in the report. Um, I do talk to a lot of victims that when they do go testify, they do get back to me and tell me how their experience was just so they can um, feel like they're um, part of this entire process. Um, they really want to be involved in what's going on. So um, from everything that I heard back from these victims, I mean, their stories are incredible, just like every other victim out there. I mean, we also, um, I know that for the first time we had a nun testify about her sexual abuse. So this is going to be a report that's going to encompass many different aspects of uh, sexual abuse. I've heard people. Um, I've heard people say that, based on some of the interviews that you have given to media outlets across the state, that perhaps there has been a leak uh, from the AG's office that someone has given you information that. Uh, I, I didn't hear that before, but I can be direct and clear that. Um, they have never given me any information. Um, all my information has been going on my gut and talking to victims and putting pieces together myself. That is an absolute fact. Um, anybody making those statements are trying to dirty the water. Is that, it's that clear. It's tough to tell with that, first of all, but what do you think the impact of this is going to be? Because there's been so much that's already come out with scandals here and in other parts of the country. I mean, do you, do you almost have a fear that there, that people are almost getting numb to some of these reports? I mean, uh, what, what do you that's a good question, Ron, because we say, what will it take? We already had three grand juries coming out of Philadelphia, 2003, 2005, 2011. We have the Altoona Johnstown report. We have Bill Cosby. We have Sandusky. We have the Boy Scouts. Pennsylvania has been the epicenter of child sex abuse. And if we would have acted as the legislature in 2003 and enacted the recommendations that the grand jury recommended then, we probably would have saved children. The boy that was raped in Scarnati's backyard in Jefferson County in that cabin, who's eight, who was eight years old, that predator would have been identified and that child wouldn't have been raped. What are we doing? What are we doing as a legislator allowing this to happen? And, and we continue to sit back and say, no, we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna wait. We're gonna wait. And, w and in the meantime, these kids continue to get abused. Th that's why the retroactive component is so important because we can identify these predators and expose them. These, these predators are not on Megan's list. They're out there, they're your neighbors. They're living next to playground, um, next to schools. So when you ask me what the impact is gonna be, I pray to God that we're able to get this legislation done now. Because I, I say that I know that this grand jury report will probably be the worst um, as it pertains to child sex abuse in the history of the United States. It will be the worst. And if we how, as- How do you know that? I'm just, because I've heard that Six dioceses, hundreds and hundreds of victims. The stories that, that, that I heard are just, heart-wrenching. The amount of victims that have wanted to come forward is just astonishing. So I know, I know some of these stories. I know families um, of girls who, whole families, four or five girls who've been sexually abused by a priest who was covered up right here in Harrisburg. So um, the amount of information is going to be overwhelming, and the stories are going to be uh, heart wrenching. Um, just, but the the main thing is the people need to hear this. The people, and that's why it was disappointing to hear that the bishops were originally going to try to block this grand jury report. Why would they silence the victims again? It was like it's it's revictimizing us all over again, trying to keep us silent. And I was actually actually pretty proud of Bishop Persico in Erie for taking the lead out there and making some of his comments. Um, we had Allentown to follow, which is my hometown. Um, 
Scranton and Greensburg and, and it was Pittsburgh and Harrisburg that were trying to stand in this way. And then you also have the Bishop of Pittsburgh who wants to see the report before it's issued. As, as a legislator, I don't get to see the report before it's issued. And here we want, there's a bishop in Pittsburgh, Zubik, who wants to see the report so he can review it um, and then make comments on it and have comments ready for when it comes out. That's insane. It, 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 even the, the Harrisburg, Gaynor uh, made some comments like, you know, that it has, like, I think he made a comment like it's, we have to make sure we get this right. Are you kidding me? We have to get this right? First of all, you haven't got it right in, in the last 50, 60, 100 years here in the diocese across Pennsylvania. And why are you saying we have to get it right? The only team that has to get this right is the Attorney General's office. We, as far as we at the diocese, aren't, aren't you know, getting this right. Do you sense any shift in political will in, in the Capitol among the legislature? To, to I, have, I have so many members in the House that come up to me and give uh, amazing support. And I have senators who also came up and said, to be honest with you, we don't want to see the retroactive up to age 50 component. We want to see that one or two year window. Um, I honestly believe if, if Senator Scarnati and Jake Corman allow this bill to run, it passes. They're not, there's, there's, I have enough votes in the House and Senate. But it, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to those two men making the right decision for the children, past, present, and future of this Commonwealth. To Ron's point, um, back in 2016 when the Altoona Johnstown report came out, the bill caught some life and then mm -hmm. didn't go anywhere as we know. What's the difference in 2018? Uh, has there been this huge worldview shift that they've talked about with Sandusky, with all the uh, Me Too movement issues that have popped up, with um, uh, that big Netflix series, The Keepers, the Keepers that spotlighted is the Baltimore yeah. Diocese? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, it's the perfect storm, we believe. Not only that, but even after the Altoona Johnstown report came out, I had members who had opposed us for years who have said, you know what, I'm done. I'm with you now. And I think a lot of members, especially on that Senate side, don't really understand what the impact is or they, I know some of them didn't even know when the Altoona Johnstown report came out that there was a report on child sex abuse from, the, from Altoona. I went to actually meet with them and they didn't even know there was a report out. So it's about educating them. And as the more we educate members, the more that they're becoming aware or they're like, oh my God, you know what, my roommate, my, my brother, my, my uncle, um, you know, they're starting to put pieces together. So we're hoping that as more information comes out, they just say, you know what, <coughs> the, the bill that we're trying to pass is good public policy. Let's pass it and then let, let the courts uh, deal with it. And we're actually willing to put several uh, severability in the bill. That way, if they would rule any part of it unconstitutional, that part could be taken out. Talking about that, has Peter Reed's office signaled any timeline on, if it's tabled now, about when the gutting, it would have to kick in the committee. Right. No. It be amended on the floor? It, then, that's exactly right. So what's the timeline on that? I actually met with Dave Reed yesterday okay. and uh, had some discussions with him, just uh, some early discussions talking about some of the language that we're looking at and, and some timeline, and we're going to continue those talks. Um, we haven't made any decision about you know where we want to go at this point or when we want to take these steps, but um, <coughs> we just want to start this processing. And um, and Dave has been let me let me tell you, the majority leader Dave Reed has been nothing but supportive. And um, when I made the comment on the on the House floor that he has a moral compass that leads him, he truly does. He's a leader, and he's going to be one that will be missed in our House because um, he's one that really you could negotiate and compromise with and we really need that in, in the house. So here's a hypothetical question. Say legislative leadership says, okay, we'll move forward on lifting the statute of limitations for criminal and civil cases, but we're not willing to go with retroactivity. Would you be able to support that? That's to that's not gonna happen in the house, I can tell you that right now. We have the support, I have the support from leadership. We're gonna run a bill that's gonna eliminate civil and criminal and have the two year window. Um, that's that's our goal right now, and I know I have the votes to pass that in the House. Um, once we pass that and send that to the Senate, 
because they already had the bill, now they, they have a couple options with it. I mean, if there's enough pressure at that point from the public and the outrage from this report, it's going to be very hard for them to stop this process. I can tell you that. Good luck voting um, against victims or changing this bill to protect the institutions. Um, there, there's some senators that are going to have some um, tough election uh, races coming up. Um, so that's another benefit for us that, guess what, your people are going to the polls. Do you want them going to the polls, uh, pressing your button, thinking you're a pedophile? Uh, it's not a really good time for that, especially in the Me Too movement and all those other things. And we're also dealing with uh, Nick Meccarelli and the Two Hill. I mean, we have members that are sexually harassing other members and staff. I mean, <laughs> the time is now to change this law. Talking of that, I mean, how weird is the vibe on the floor right now with Representative Tuhul there with members of House Security? Mr. Riccarelli was a couple of seats down. He's now been moved to the back of the chamber. I mean, what was it like coming in there and, and seeing that for you? Um, for me, you know, I, I go about my daily business. And I think most members did. I think um, where the impact was really felt, though, is when I would have grade school kids coming up and we would have dogs sweeping the floor um, just recently and they were wondering you know why the police were in the house sweeping the floor all the time and um, and then having to explain to them the situation that we're in because I wanted to be honest with them and um, I think that's that's more heartbreaking to me than having to go in there I mean when we as legislators if we're going we're doing our job we can't worry about what's going on um, with certain people. Should the House be moving to get Representative uh, Micarelli ousted? It's, it, for me, it's a difficult question because I, I've heard all the allegations and I'm somebody that if, if he was convicted, absolutely, 100%. And I don't, you know, I heard all the stories and, the, and it's the same thing with like Tom Calta Jerome. If, um, you know, if they were convicted, they're alleged, and um, and people have asked me, well, you know, will you ask somebody to resign? And my comment was, I won't ask anybody to resign. That's they have to, their own moral um, ability to make that decision. Um, it's not I'm not making that decision for anybody. Um, one of the arguments that the church has for years used is the idea that if the law is, is vastly changed here in Pennsylvania that we'll have this groundswell of victims coming forth um, and potentially you know financially being a burden to the church um, <laughs> financially being a burden to the church <laughs> sorry that our sexual abuse wasn't a burden to all of our children who suffered I know where you're going with that. Yeah. I just wanted to make that comment because Let's I talk about that because we we actually have not seen that in states that have mm -hmm. reformed their laws. We we haven't seen the groundswell. Can you talk about that and also the dynamic of, of you know right. victims that have been harboring their trauma for decades? Okay. We we hear that all the time. Oh, you're going to bankrupt the church. There hasn't been one diocese who has um, filed real bankruptcy. They, they have done reorganizational bankruptcy, uh, a couple of them, but no diocese has filed bankruptcy. That is just a, a, a scare tactic to the congregation to maybe make phone calls to think that something's going to be taken away from them. That's that's simply not going to happen. And to clarify things, um, it is unconstitutional to revive. The, expired criminal. That's correct. The, the, the United States Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional, ex post facto. You can't go back on a criminal statute because you would be changing essentially what the crime was. By changing the st civil statute, all we're saying is we're changing the time frame that you're able to come forward. We're not changing the crime. The crime already took place. It is what it is. We're just extending the period for the victim to come forward. From the victims and the advocacy advocates that you talk to, I mean, do they have a sense of hope for this legislation coming through with the grand jury report, or are they optimistic that maybe something's getting done, or are they still this is our mindset where we'll believe it when we see it? No, there's there's a lot of hope. They are. There's a lot of victims that reach out to myself, my executive assistant Pam, all the time, um, checking on things, how it's going, hanging on to every word. Um, you know what. 
what does scare me though is after the Altoona Johnstown report came out and we did all that stuff, passed bills and the Supreme, um, the Senate essentially killed it. We had that young man in, in Altoona Johnstown hang himself. Um, I, I wish I could say that that is rare, but in our office, we get calls from parents every month for children who kill themselves because of this. That's a fact. And they're, they are hanging on for that hope that they will be able to um, go into a civil court of law and, and seek some type of justice. That's our, that's our only recourse, though. You know, we would love to go into a civil court law and, and lock them up. So, you know, our only course is through the civil court. Have you noticed, however, any kind of a change in uh, perspective of the victims, a sense of empowerment? That was the thing that struck yeah. me watching the Keepers, is that social media really helped spread, uh, unite them. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you've uh, had that experience as well. I, I can honestly tell you I love all my brothers and sisters, um, all my friend, fellow victims out there, and, and that's the way we talk. It's, it is a brotherhood. Um, it is a love because sometimes um, the other person on the other end of the phone really under, understand and knows what's really going on in your head and how you're suffering. So, um, you know, when they speak to me, they know that what they get is real, that I'm not pulling any punches with them, and I'm actually there to listen to them, and they're there to listen to me. So. It definitely, the grand jury uh, was a, a great empowering tool for victims who got the ability to go in there and be heard and who've never been heard ever before. So, you know, having somebody listen to you and care uh, is important. There's no doubt about that. I'm curious about this, and, and forgive me if I'm, I'm going too far, but I mean, you're pretty clear about your opinion on the church and how your experiences shaped your view of the church as an institution. I'm wondering what it's done to you personally to hear actual faith. Has that survived in exterior space, or is it, are the two linked? Um, I love my faith, and my job, I believe, is to um, wrong this right, to clean out the church, to bring the church back to the way that we expect it to be. Um, now, my church that I was brought up in, I have only been back there two times since one of the priests actually stopped me from going inside the door one day and the other two times I've been back I buried my childhood friends. Now that doesn't stop me from going to to church on Saturday. Um, one of my um, old-time teachers um, from grade school was uh, getting her jubilee I'm one of the nuns, so, um, you know, they have, uh, I was up um, for their mass in the convent. I love going up and seeing the nuns. Um, they're very supportive, and it's um, very, it's comforting, quite honestly. And a lot of my teachers are up there at the convent, so, um, you know, my faith survives, but no doubt it's, it's hurt, it's damaged, um, but... It, it has it has given me the ability to forgive Father Graff for what he did to me because I because I don't know what his situation was before. I don't know if he was abused by another priest or another somebody else or what his situation was. I know he was very messed up, but to me, I can never never forgive the diocese for knowing what they knew and allowed it to happen. I mean, just my priest alone, you know, 12, 13 different parishes. We put his numbers at over 200 victims. You know, they send him to uh, a sexual rehab center, uh, the Servants of the Park Elites, which the Roman Catholic Church set up in 1947 to treat sexual abuse uh, uh, offenders. And then from there, they put him into another diocese where they abuse 20 kids. I will never forgive them for their actions. Um, they will have to answer to God, um, and uh, they're not going to like the response to that. In the in the wake of the, um, the scandals we had out of Boston, out of Philadelphia in the 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, we saw the U.S. Conference of Bishops implement some changes and um, policies to protect children. Um, 
Do you are, are you confident that that policy has been um, rigorous and that since then that no abuse is happening at the level that we may have you know seen in the 80s and 90s and, and might see out of this grand jury report? Well, definitely they know they're being watched now, so they're very, very careful. Um, do I believe that there's still some cover-ups going on out there? Absolutely. If the Attorney General's office never found that memo, uh, Father Polson, do you think that the Erie Diocese would have turned over Father Polson? No. So they're still very protective of their own. We know that. So, um, you know, it, it's... Um, It's, 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 it's a shame that for all those years, all that abuse took place, and, and now, um, you know, they hid behind the laws, and now they're still hiding behind the laws today. That's frustrating. Why do you think that, um, as you said earlier, Pennsylvania itself has seen, you know, the Sandusky, we have Bill Cosby, we have... Um, Salisbury School and, and nationally, we see child sex abuse happens everywhere. It happens, you know, in U.S. gymnastics, yeah. U.S. swimming, it happens everywhere. Especially in the household. Why, why does the Catholic Church, though, get so much attention? Um, the cover-up. The, the cover-up is actually worse than the crime itself. Um, if they would have identified these predator priest right away and turn them over to the local officials of the police, we wouldn't be in this situation today that we're in. I mean, um, their actions spoke volumes. They protected the priest, they protected the church. That was their mission. And the victims were just left to die, to suffer the rest of their lives. And, you know, when I talk about abolishing the statute of limitations and murder, there's no statute of limitation. Um, I often say that sexual abuse is, is worse than murder because um, a lot of us would have just preferred to have been murdered instead of suffering the rest of our lives with this pain. It would have been a hell of a lot easier. And, and that might sound ridiculous, but when you go through some of the, the, the suffering, the mental, um, the physical pains, um, sometimes you'd just rather be dead. And because I would always say that um, when this is going to go away is when I take my last breath. That's when the suffering will end. I'm, you know, and it's ridiculous here. I am 47. I just turned 47. And even up to this point today, Evie, I have never called myself a survivor. I'm, every time I speak, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And people say, well, why are you, look what you're doing, you're a survivor. And I say, well, if you look at all my close friends, they're dead. And I don't know if I've made it yet. Because I know, it, sometimes I honestly feel that the older I get, the worse it gets. And that's messed up. And I've been, I've been the therapy five, six separate times. And I swear, the older I'm getting, the, the mental and physical battle is, is getting tougher. Victims have been portrayed as uh, wanting to, you know, if, if, if everything works out with the reform of the law, wanting to go to court and, you know, get a big fat, you know, financial settlement. Is that really what victims want? Do, they, do you think victims want money? No, we, we want justice, and that's our only avenue to access the court is through the civil court. And unfortunately, um, there's institutions out there that they will only stop this when they start paying out settlements. Victims do um, want some retribution um, through compensation here, but again, if a victim goes into court, they have to have proof of evidence that they were sexually abused. If they, just because a victim goes into court doesn't mean they're getting a settlement. That's not going to happen. You know, you actually have, you have to have some type of evidence here. The onus is going to be on the victim to prove their case. So, uh, to be honest with you, I don't really think, I don't, I don't know why the church is fighting this so hard. I mean, yes, they're going to um, have to pay out some liability, but 
um, in the eyes of, of God and the people, you would be seen as doing the right thing, taking care of your own. I mean, we were altar boys. We were put out on the curb as trash. Why, why wouldn't they want to help us? You know, and people, you want to say that, you know, people, oh, this is a money grab. Well, guess what? I, I, have, I have personal friends who could not hold jobs down, who um, couldn't pay their rent, who needed, um, you know, $5,000 worth of medications every month. They deserve something for their pain. And, and it's the victim's right for that. Whether or not they get that, that's going to be up to the court to decide. And whether they have evidence. But at least it gives us the avenue to attempt it. Do you have uh, Governor Wolf on board in supporting this legislation? I already met with Governor Wolf previously, and he said that if the bill would get to his desk, he would sign it. Will he be out? Will you be asking him to come out and use his office as a bully pulpit to kind of I, move this along? I know that the Attorney General Josh Shapiro already said he would love to see the governor uh, get more involved in this, and we'll be making a plea to the governor. Um, we know we have his support. We don't necessarily have to, to meet with him right now until we get all, you know all our ducks in a row, uh, and then we'll probably meet with him because we know that he will sign it. There's no doubt about it. I wonder if you could just talk uh, politics and explain to people who aren't that familiar with it, uh, from your perspective, the influence of the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference, um, legislators up on the Hill. How does how does that work for people that aren't aware? Well, uh, I, I make this comment back home often because I don't consider myself a true politician, and I often say that I hate lobbyists because they have such an influence on what happens here in Harrisburg. When you're there representing the people and you see big time lobbyists come in with big time money and influence decisions of legislators, it is absolutely sickening. And when my bill did pass the House 180 to 15 and went to the Senate, the Catholic Conference hired about 39 lobbyists to work 50 senators. Victims, we don't have that kind of money. The only thing that we have is our voices. How can we compete with something like that. So it is discouraging, um, you know, seeing these $300 an hour lobbyists um, working against good public policy, working against children, working to protect pedophiles. I mean, think about that. The Catholic Conference is working to protect pedophiles. That's what we're talking about here. They're not working to protect children. That that has to change, and you know I, I honestly believe in um, campaign refinance laws and changing them and reform. And you know there should be limits, and there should be more disclosure from lobbyists. We don't even know. We know they're spending other money, but we can't even track it. Why is that? You know we, we the the. The Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvanians should have a right to see, you know, how much money they're spending, where that money is going, and quite honestly, I honestly think that they're spending so close to that limit of being able to influence political decisions that it almost has to be impacting their tax status. That's real. So, but where do we, where can we get all those numbers? We need to find that out. Because, and I can tell you this, I, I'm, I have so many parishioners, even from my local church, that come in my office and they'll say, you know, that church won't get another dime for me. You know, I, I'm not putting another penny in that basket because I know where this money is going. They're closing schools, they're closing all these different offices. You know, that's not our fault. That's not the victim's fault. We haven't got this law passed yet, you know. Uh... I do know that some of these bishops live in beautiful mansions and they have servants and I'm sure in the eyes of God um, that's not what he imagined uh, that life to be like. That's why I admire Pope Francis. When Lynn Abrams launched the investigation into the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, she was assailed for being on an anti-Catholic 
uh, campaign, we don't really hear that anymore. Do you think that's a signal that maybe things have really changed, the opinions have changed, and the outlook on reform has changed? That talking point has gone uh, and to waste. That's why the, that talking point didn't work, so they're moving on to the, the next talking point that does work. That's all that is. How do you think the Me Too movement has helped change the debate over uh, this legislation or the health system? It's, it's an empowering um, aspect, giving people the ability to speak. I mean, and people who weren't able before now are saying, guess what, me too. So, you know, it's, it's like building that army. You know, united we stand, <coughs> divided we fall. So if we, if we can stay together and, and more people join this fight across this commonwealth, we have to be heard, we have to be recognized. Um, we, well think about the statistics too. One in four girls, one in six boys will be sexually abused before the age of 18 in this commonwealth. That's frightening. So, victims are out there. Um, I think one of the last statistics I saw about how much it's costing, I think it was about nine billion dollars it cost the United States last year, sexual abuse. Guess who's paying for that, a lot of that? The taxpayers. It's not the institutions that were abusing these kids or the families, the fathers, the uncles. It's actually the taxpayers that are putting this money up. So, um, you know, I'm sure the taxpayers don't want to be on the hook anymore either here. So, you know, the institutions should be covering these expenses. This may go down as your legislative legacy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to come here for this. I never expected to be a representative. Um, you know, it, it all changed on March 26, 2009, when my second childhood friend took a gun, put it to his chest, and shot himself. That was the last day I was going to be quiet. And um, that's when I met with my representative, Dante Santoni, who was amazing and, and great and compassionate. Um, and really, he's the one that's given me this ability when he retired. And I was on the golf course, and I got the call saying he was done. If I wanted this, this would be the time. And that means the world to me. And to be able to be here uh, fighting for victims. And, you know, when I first came here, I thought this was about myself. And as time went on, I realized this had nothing to do with me. This was being able to give a voice to all those other victims who couldn't speak up. And I wanted them to know that I am here for you. I know you can't be here, but I am gonna be here for you and I'm gonna fight hard to get us justice. And when I can walk away from this legislature, I wanna be able to say that Pennsylvania is the best in protecting children, period. There might be someone watching who has never come forward and is still struggling with coming forward. What would you want to say to the person in that situation? Um, don't be afraid to speak out. Reach out to my office. I'm willing to talk to you. I know it's a scary thing. I remember the first time I um, did my article and I thought, my God, what are people going to think? And I had nothing but support from so many people. And that was the main difference because I thought, my God, this could be the end of me. And as more victims started reaching out, it was very empowering. So um, it, it's, it's sometimes you have to be able to let that go and talk about it. And um, you just got to find somebody who's willing and that understands and, and w is going to listen, not talk. We d they just need to be heard. One, one real quick political process question. Um, for our readers, what what does it take now to get the bill on tables in the House, to get it moving back? Uh, just a simple conversation with Dave Reed and uh, saying let's let's start moving it. We would probably need about, um, since the bill is tabled, we can get the bill untabled. Um, we would need probably three legislative days um, to move it. So notice second and third. Um, so you know, it, it's still a process, 
and we want to make sure that we don't run out of time since we're coming to the end of the session at the end of this year. So that's why it's important. We're hoping um, the Attorney General Office comes out soon with the report. That would be very helpful. Even if it, even if he waits to the end of June, you know, we'll still have a, a handful, maybe 12 session days to get things done. We only need three of them because once it goes back to the Senate, it's it's really they need one day to move that bill. So, um, you know, it's um, it shouldn't be anything that's out of the ordinary here, especially when we move bills so quick sometimes, you know, without even uh, thinking about it. When you say one day in the Senate, you're just talking about a simple concurrence vote? That's right. Which seems optimistic given? Well, you know, I guess my plea or my call um, to Senator Scarnati and Senator Corman would be to do the right thing, stand with victims, um, especially Corman, where I have victims from Penn State who are timed out of the statute of limitations who want the ability to go to a civil court. He's blocking them from getting justice. Um, you have kids taking to Senator Scarnati's backyard and being sexually abused and raped. Um, these guys need to stand up for what is right. It's that simple. And, um, you know, and if they don't, may God bless their soul. Mr. Rossi, thanks very much for coming in today. Thank you for having me.